the fourth lesson, we are going to hear about gospel reversals. The lesson is from Luke 1, 50 through 55. The words are Mary's song, which we just heard in the previous carol. In this passage, Mary, still a very young woman facing a difficult and uncertain future, sheds light on the nature and the capabilities of God. God's mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, God has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. God has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. God has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. God has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised to our ancestors. It's going to be a very short message today. Mary, I mentioned last week right here, even though she is Jesus' mother, is also notably Jesus' first disciple, the first person to say yes to God's will as it relates to Jesus himself. Not only is she an exemplary disciple because of her courage to know and to do the will of God, but here in Luke 1, she demonstrates that she is also a poet. In fact, she sings the first Christian song that has ever been a song of thanks to God, despite the difficult times that are ahead for her. Now, unlike modern American songwriters, the music of 2,000 years ago and even the poems of 2,000 years ago are very different. Um, if anybody in this room knows other languages, perhaps in um, the second and third languages that you might be familiar with, poetic norms and conventions are different. Not every language rhymes their poems like we do in English. Roses are red, violets are blue. I went to church and so did. Yes, we love to rhyme frequently in English. In the Hebrew language, in the kind of Hebrew that Mary would have spoke and sung in, not so much rhyming. Okay? But she offers this beautiful, powerful poem nonetheless. In fact, in the Hebrew language, the main hallmark of their poems, not rhyming, but what is called parallelism. One line says something, and another line says almost the same thing to either contrast or fill out the meaning. For example, in Psalm 1, it says this, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment... There's one line, and the next line, parallel, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Here, those are very similar, and yet they sort of round out one another's meaning. Sometime, the second line in Hebrew poems uh, means just the upside down of what came before. Also from Psalm 1. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. That's how Hebrew poetry works. Usually in parallel tracks, sometimes upside down. So in Mary's poem, perhaps you heard in her words some of these same things. Mary sings, God has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. Do you hear the contrast? The antithesis? Mary knows what she's doing. The next verse in Luke 1 says this. He has filled the hungry with good things, but the rich has sent them away empty. Do you hear the contrast? Mary's on a roll with these contrasts until the very next line. She says this. God has remembered his servant Israel. And everybody in Israel would know what's about to come next. What's the opposite of Israel? Who needs to be put down? 
the Romans, the Gentiles, everybody who's not in the family of God? And does Mary deliver that line? No. No. She just leaves it with the mercy of God and keeps talking about the mercy of God. Sometimes the most important thing you can say is what everybody expects you to say, and you don't say it at all. Try that at a Christmas party sometime. Once again, rulers are brought down from their thrones, humble are lifted up, hungry are filled, the rich are sent away empty, Israel is helped by God, And it turns out that in Jesus, God has an agenda to help everybody else too, including you and me, and bring them into this family. Mary is quite a brilliant songwriter. Has anyone ever said something deeply impactful to you by not saying what could have been said, what you had expected them to say? I've had a few stunning moments like that. Um, A very short story. When I was a young adult, I crashed my family's favorite car. I was picking up a girl for a date, probably shouldn't have been picking her up. It was an ice storm, probably shouldn't have been driving to begin with. I was driving too quickly. This was in the 80s. You were supposed to have your seatbelt on, even in the olden days in the 80s. I didn't have my seatbelt on. I crested a hill tapped on the brakes a few times. The car never even thought about stopping. I went right through the curve at the bottom of the hill and put my family's favorite car like smack in the middle of a huge oak tree. Because I wasn't wearing the seatbelt, I smashed the windshield with my head. Right. Now you understand. Uh, Providentially, a neighbor drove by just like a minute later Drove me back to my house. My parents were gone. My sister was there. When my parents found out, five or six hours later, I had a few stitches in my head, the whole front. It was was a little messy. Um, I expected my dad to ask questions like, what were you thinking? Do you know how much that car cost? Do you know how how long we saved for that car? Do you know how much your mother loved that car? There were none of those questions. My dad simply had two things to say, which was, did you do this on purpose, son? I said, of course not, except that, you know, there are a few things I shouldn't have been doing that I was doing. And then he said, are are you permanently hurt or did anybody else get hurt? Because he didn't know the whole story yet. It's like, no, just me, I've got these stitches. And then he put his arm around me and said, it's all going to be okay. What a good dad move, right? What my dad did for, in a very modest way, out of love for me that day, God, our Heavenly Father, in Jesus, is doing for all of us. And Mary is the first one to know it. And she can't help but to sing about it, how God is literally going to turn the world upside down so it's no longer insiders and outsiders, but everybody invited to be with Jesus. Perhaps this Christmas, you will have an opportunity to leave something unsaid or to not do the expected thing and to have that be a tremendous gift of love to those around you. We are going to sing together about this plan that God is up to, to turn things upside down. I invite you to stand for the song, and then you can have a seat at the end of it.